All right, let's go in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. He says in verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 1. Everybody there say amen. amen. All right, that's most of us. Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold towards you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Word of God this morning. Thank you for the power that the Word of God brings. I pray that it will break the cold heart, Lord, that it will warm the cold heart that needs to be warmed and set on fire again. Lord, that you would give them zeal who needs zeal. I ask that you'd comfort the feeble and the weak-minded, Lord, that they would receive the encouragement and the comfort they need to get back and get right with God and to feel that comfort that you can only give. Lord, I pray for that heart that is um, uh, not turned on at the moment, but will be turned on through the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I do pray that your uh, word would go forth and, and crush the heart that is hardened against the things of God and would bring to light those hidden things of darkness and in their own life and will show forth uh, praise and glory for you. I pray, Lord, that this uh, message would speak to our hearts, that we would take it uh, to us personally and would go forth evidentially with God's Word and with the power and the Holy Ghost. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Paul is uh, addressing the church here, uh, not as a whole, uh, but against a special group of uh, teachers in the midst of the Corinthians who were teaching false doctrine. And uh, this is a very helpful passage to us because we have many false teachers in the church today as well uh, and in our culture. Uh, some of them are very blatant and they're very open. They're easy to recognize. Um, in congregations, we have people who are being influenced by the Mormons trying to uh, convince people that the Book of Mormon is historically accurate and authentic history. Uh, they teach strange doctrines that have no correspondence with Scripture. Um, and yet they try to hide under the general guise of being just like other Christians. Uh, some are being misled by them. <coughs> there are others that you might meet at the airport uh, called the Hare Krishna group, um, uh, Hinduism. Uh, there are Scientologists. There are the false Jehovah Witnesses. There are the Torah keepers. There are the black Hebrew Israelites uh, that want to keep you under the bondage of the law. Uh, some are more subtle. They're taught within the church itself. There are some churches that uh, espouse transcendent meditation and various forms of self-improvement and demonic practices that may not look overtly uh, demonic, but are a little more subtle because that's how Satan would love to be, and that's how he is. Uh, there are Christian homosexuals, as they call themselves, who have formed their own churches with uh, that teach that homosexuality is an acceptable lifestyle among Christians. Uh, there are many, uh, many who are teaching legalism. Uh, they're teaching spiritual elitism. Uh, there are some that are teaching spirit animals and shamanism uh, to get you in this experience, uh, something outside of the realm of reality. And here is the commonality of all these groups. Uh, they are being used as a tool of the devil to derail churches Amen. and to rob individual Christians of their liberty and their joy in the Lord, and to oppose the power of the gospel um, of Christ in a community, in a church, and even a nation. And so, but not only do these false teachers oppose the gospel, um, the world system at large has no affinity uh, with those who bear the name Christian. Uh, they, the world is what we call antichrist. In that word, as they'll take anything and everything that is against or instead of Christ. You can name any God in culture, but once you name the Lord Jesus Christ, the claws come out. The chanclas come off. Uh, the, 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 the boxing gloves come off and the fists come out. The teeth are shown. They don't like Christ. They hate Christ, and that's the world system. 
And so the apostle, uh, uh, sorry, the apostle rather, uh, writes with a pastor's heart in this passage. He writes in verse 1, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, uh, who in presence am base among you. So you can see the, that these words are the words of a faithful shepherd who sees his sheep under attack uh, and from wolves in sheep's clothing. He says, I'm base among you, um, but being absent, and I'm bold towards you. So I'm base among you, meaning I'm lowly when I'm with you, but in my letters, they're not so lowly. They're a little bit more bold. And uh, Paul kind of switches gears here in the last a uh, few uh, uh, chapters of 2 Corinthians. He's been very comforting and encouraging and things like that. Still calling sin, sin, but now he changes gears a little bit in chapter 10. And this is what these teachers were saying about him in Corinth. They said, well, don't pay any attention to Paul. He sounds very impressive when he writes, but when he's there in person, he's a little shorter. He's not as powerful as he is. Uh, when he comes, he's very meek and he's, he's, he's a little weakling. So don't pay attention to anything about Paul. And Paul says that, look, that's what they're saying about me. But when, when I come, he links this with the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And that was the attitude in which Paul ministered to people is in the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And if you're a minister, if you're a Christian, you are a minister. You are a servant, a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. You should be ministering in the meekness and gentleness of Christ. But sometimes you have to turn on the heat a little bit because someone has a stubborn heart. And they don't want to listen to what you have to say. And so that was the attitude that Paul had. And it was a spirit that can be easily, uh, very easily uh, construed as weakness or timidity uh, or timidity by the world's standards. Say, well, someone who's meek is weak. Uh, meekness, need I mind you, is strength under control. Stre it's kind of like if a little, uh, uh, my 10-year-old son walked up to Mike Tyson and just started you know, railing him, so I can whoop you, I can beat you up. And Mike Tyson says, okay, okay, right? But he's practicing meekness because God knows he has the strongest punch in all of boxing, modern boxing. He'll knock him into next week, right? And I'm sure your mom could do the same thing. <laughs> At least my mom could. And so uh, Christ never lorded over people. His power was exercised in meekness and in humility. That's how his power was exercised. And uh, meekness, like I said, is not weakness. It's strength or power under control. It's the ability to be angry at sin, yet willing to suffer abuse for Christ's sake. To be accused of things um, and suffer that in the meekness of Christ. It's putting your um, rights aside, your rights aside for the edification of others. Say, hey, I know that I, I, I could have this and this should be happening to me, but you know, I'm going to prefer someone else above myself. That's Christ-like. That's Christ. Christ could have said, I don't need to hang up on this cross, but he did. He did. And so our Lord was indeed very meek. He was very gentle. Children would run up to him. He would welcome them. He would pray over them. He would touch them. He would heal people. He was very meek, very gentle, but there were times when he had to speak very severely to those hardened hearts. He would say, oh, generation of vipers, right? Who's going to deliver you from the wrath to come, right? If you didn't want to receive John, then why, why are you coming at me like this? You know, and I'm paraphrasing here, but Jesus uh, was absolutely angry when he drove out the money changers in the temple. Uh, to say that Jesus was always... Uh, um, uh, just gentle savior, this effeminate figure that we see on paintings of Jesus and having long hair and soft, uh, no scars, no rough hands. Jesus was a man. Amen. And he had a little bit of anger come out when he saw that uh, his eyes were blazing. His arm was lifted against uh, up against those who were destroying the people of God. He says, my house is a house of prayer. And you're making it into a den of thieves. Jesus didn't appreciate that, and a good pastor doesn't appreciate that when something comes into the church that's trying to destroy and creep in. He wants to squash it, and he wants to do that in meekness and humility, sometimes uh, overtly speaking very severely. And so I, I want to say this, that let's not make the uh, mistake of judging by the outer appearance. Someone may, uh, like I said in Sunday school, someone may 
come in with just um, uh, uh, terrible clothes, or someone may come in with tattoos up and down their face all across their head. Uh, it doesn't make them anything less than you are. Amen? There were all people. We have different backgrounds. We come from different parts of the union or across the globe, wherever. Um, so we don't need to make the mistake of judging after the outward appearance. Just because they saw Jesus as one way and he acted that way doesn't mean that he couldn't turn the switch and become the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? Yes. And so in verse 2, Paul is saying, But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with you uh, with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. And so simply because Paul did not use carnal um, methods, because he didn't use those carnal methods um, to exert the um, persona or the perception of a strong personality, some believers and some in the Corinth Corinthian church thought he was just a weakling. Oh, he's just, he's, he ain't nobody. I can push him over any day. And so the false teachers knew nothing about walking in the Spirit. They didn't promote that anyway. And, and, and Paul didn't want to write, or he didn't write to condemn them. You, you get what I'm saying? He didn't write to condemn these people, but instead he was trying, to, uh, he was writing so that when he came to Corinth, he didn't have to be bold. He could operate in the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And so uh, Paul didn't want to spend his time uh, discipling uh, and disciplining the errant members of the Corinthian church uh, when he could be building them up and encouraging them. Amen. No one wants to spend their time uh, uh, helping out with these things. And it's, hey, hey, let's get encouragement. Let's, let's have this. Let's get along. And so, but he says, when I come, if need be, I'm fully prepared to employ the weapons at my disposal. Amen. He says, you, I'm coming to you in the meekness and gentleness of Christ. When I'm absent from you, I, I'm bold in my writing, yes. But when I come before you, I want to be gentle. But he says, I, I, I don't want to come bold when I'm present, verse 2. He says, but I, I, you know, I, wherewith I think to be bold against some, those false teachers, he says, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. And so with that in mind, he breaks down for us the Christian's warfare. The Christian's warfare. What can Christians use to counteract the culture around us. It's not bullets, and it's not ballots. It's the power of the Spirit of God. Amen. And so how do we counteract the views of the world? Uh, how do we respond when we see a loved one uh, threatened by error or uh, has some false notion of a false idea which can take over a church, it can take over a community, it can take over a home? Today we're being faced with a very powerful threat of homosexuality in the community that wishes to impose on us certain things through legislation that they say they're opposed of or opposed by, uh, you know, by law, whatever. It's an unrighteous lifestyle um, upon our young people in our schools, not all schools, uh, but in a lot of public institutions. And uh, just for an insight, there's an LGBTQ high school opened up in Phoenix this August uh, to offer students an alternative to uh, their education in regular high school centered around homosexual history and curriculum. Students will be uh, able to enroll at the Queer Blended Learning Center uh, this August. Already, have, People are already uh, signed up for it. Located in downtown Phoenix for uh, an LGBTQ plus youth nonprofit called 1N10. 1 in 10. And so it's happening in our city whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not. Maybe that's the first time you heard that. Uh, they were reporting on this a year ago. Many Christians are then asking, well, how can we oppose this? How, what are the weapons that we can employ? Uh, not only that, but we find ourselves based and harassed and bombarded daily by sexual themes, implying that any form of sexuality is acceptable. We are constantly assaulted by crude and offensive slogans on the back of people's cars. There's, there's terrible words on cars that my sons who are learning to read are reading them and saying, Daddy, what is that? Turn, just don't look at it. Turn your eye from it. When I was a kid, you never would see that stuff. Amen. You'd never see those things, but we grew up in a different culture. And so uh, we're just assaulted with billboards on, and advertisements on YouTube and social media. Drug dealers do their best. They do their very best to hook our young people on narcotics and fentanyl and drugs. They do a really good job. 
Case in point, according to the DEA in Arizona, the leading cause of death for those between the ages of uh, 15 and 44 in the United States is drug overdose. Drug overdose. Uh, I just saw that uh, uh, there, it, there was 34 kids under the, year, under the age of five. Under the age of five, 34 kids last year in Arizona died from fentanyl. Five years old. Lachlan, stand up. Come here. My son's five years old. Can you imagine 34 little five-year-olds die from drug overdose? Fentanyl. He's sleeping. He's pretending. <laughs> I, I can't imagine this precious life that God has given me to raise to die from drug overdose because of a pill that's being produced for less than 25 cents. 34. And that number is expected to double this year. Drug dealers are not playing around and it's not a game. And that's our culture. Pornographers push their filth at us everywhere. Much but not all of academia openly espouses Marxism and communism in our classrooms. Not all of them. So how do we stem this uh, downward slide into national disaster? He says this in verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. What does that mean? Well, we, we walk physically in these bodies. I didn't see a bunch of spirits come in here this morning. I saw flesh and blood. Amen. Thank God. Otherwise, I probably ran out of here. But uh, we do not war after the flesh. That is the evil, the evil nature that indwells every single man, even all of us today. We talked about that monster inside. Is that our natural man who wants to sin? That's, just, that's who we are, that ungodly nature that is anti-God. So although we're walking in this flesh, we don't war after the natural man, is what Paul is saying. So Paul says that we don't employ the weapons of the flesh. So what are the weapons that we can employ? What does the world use? I'll ask first, what does the world use to solve problems that it recognizes in society? The world uh, uses coercion. The world uses intimidation. The world uses manipulation. The world uses destructive policy. The, Lord, the world uses pressure groups, compromises, demonstrations that ultimately result in conflict, in boycotts, in pickets, in strikes, in attempts to pressure people and to do what others want. That's how the world operates. These are the weapons of the world. It does not have any others. What, are, what carnal weapons does man, a man or a woman, use? Human ingenuity and wisdom. Human ingenuity and wisdom, showmanship, flash, charisma, charm, whatever you want to call it, uh, persuasive personalities, and eloquence devoid of the Spirit of God. So it's understandable why those who are governed by the flesh would seek to employ the uh, fleshly weapons to get things done because this is what Paul, uh, uh, his adversaries were saying that Paul was trying to do. Say, Paul was very bold and he's just, you know, he's trying to use his fleshly weapons and he says, no, 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 on the contrary. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Yeah. He says, he says back in verse 2, he says, I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we had walked according to the flesh or as we are walking according to the flesh. And so what then are, are our weapons? Well, they are mighty, they are powerful, and they are capable, and they accomplish something that's worthwhile. They will, the Bible says, uh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, they're not devoid of the Spirit of God, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds of evil. But when you ask yourself, what are these weapons? It doesn't say. The weapons that we have at our disposal that are available to us, he doesn't write them in the text. I find that interesting. Because Paul understands that the Corinthians know what they are. Um, we find them scattered throughout Scripture, so we have to go to other passages uh, to, in order to understand what he's talking about here. I'll just give you one. We're not going to visit them all. But I believe the first weapon in our arsenal is truth. Truth. The Christian is given an insight into life and how the world operates and is in the system and the reality that others do not have. You, you see things from a different perspective. Amen. And to throw out the truth, uh, some people who don't see eye to eye with you don't understand what in the world you're talking about. How can you rejoice 
over a man uh, who was God, who died on a cross, who rose again from the grave uh, with histor historical proof and infallible proof. And, and how can you believe that? And he's coming again to judge the world and you're going to go to heaven. People look at you and they're baffled. Well, the Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Uh, that's the whole thing. Our problem is not people, but rather against principalities. Uh, the problem is against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in very high places. And so we wrestle with spiritual powers um, behind the scenes, and we need to understand that. God's plan for us is not immunity from struggle, but victory through struggle and from struggle. God wants us to be victorious. And that is what the truth is all about. Truth is realism, keeping it real. I try to do that as best as I can with you, and I hope you do that with me. And so uh, when you know Christ, you get an understanding of how the world truly operates. You, think, you see things for what they really are. And that is so important that we understand Scripture, that we would refresh our minds with truth all the time because we are constantly bombarded with falsehood. Uh, there's, uh, you can go on Google or whatever search engine and you can uh, get AI pictures now. But you have to be careful with AI and detect certain things. AI doesn't get into detail very good. You may have a little kid playing at Tresco or eating something and she'll have six fingers on her hand. Her eye will be construed because it's a falsehood. It's a false image. But you as, you as in truth, your job as a Christian is to detect the falsehood. How do you do that? By knowing truth. They tell that with the Secret Service and, and money laundering and fraud and things like that. They only handle real money throughout all of their training. And then, uh, and through their testing, they slip in a false one in there. And they catch it right away. They say, that doesn't feel right, doesn't smell right, doesn't fold right, whatever it is. I don't know what all their testing is. I didn't go. And so, uh, but that's how you detect falsehood is by knowing the truth. You don't have to know all the falsehood in the world out there to go soul winning. You have to know the gospel. You have to know truth. And if you know the truth, the Holy Spirit will lead God and direct you into all truth. And when that error comes up, he'll put the red light on and your brain says, check that, check that eh, 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 red light going off, whatever you need. And that's how we do that. And so we're bombarded with illusion and with error that we face every single day. Uh, and it's easy. It's, it's easy to drift um, back into thinking the way everybody thinks around us. If you, if you hang around a bunch of people who just constantly uh, complain and say, oh, the uh, Christian life's so hard, I, I can't do this, well, you're going to start thinking that way. If you hang around someone who's always causing drama, you're going to be thinking that way. If you hang around someone who uh, is joyful and is expectant and is hopeful in the Lord, well, then you're going to start thinking that way too. But it's very easy to drift away when we get into uh, hard times or situations or temptations and it drags us further and further away from God and we start to think the way everybody else thinks around us if we're not engaging our minds with truth Amen. and our culture with truth. So the first and I believe the greatest weapon of all is truth and the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. And as we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus is a man who understands life. Amen. He ignores much of the visible symptoms and he strikes right at the heart in certain, uh, at the cause of certain events. And if we're going to follow him, we should be viewing things like Jesus, viewing things very differently. Another weapon, secondly, is love. Love is a great weapon. Uh, and everywhere in Scripture, the Word of God links truth with love. You can't have truth without love. You can't have love without truth. Uh, and so he tells us in Ephesians 4, speaking the truth in hate. No, 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 that's not how you make disciples. It's love. Amen? Love is a very powerful weapon. And when you begin to treat people with courtesy instead of anger, um, when you attempt and you accept them as people with feelings just like yours, and understand that they too are struggling with difficulties just like you are, and oftentimes get yourself out of focus. When you see yourself as that, by the grace of God, there go I, instead of judgmental, when you begin to treat them as people who are in trouble, who need help because they're not on the same spiritual level as you, um, then you'll approach them in a different way. You'll say, you know what? I know you don't understand. That's fine. Now, let me tell you the truth and what it is, right? 
And that is one of the reasons why Christians must be very careful how they approach everyone. Amen. Not just other believers, but sinful people. Uh, and, and just normal people in general. You have to be careful how you approach everyone because, th- I was saying this in Sunday school, we can have that pharisaical attitude. Say, well, I'm a Christian, so I'm better than you. We, Everyone in this room, I believe this church has done a good job saying, no, I don't think that way, and I believe that's true. But there's churches all across America with seasoned saints or even young saints that have a, a, a they say they have a zeal, but they're very harsh on people. Even the pastor is very harsh. And if the pastor is very harsh, the people will take the attributes of the pastor and become that. Amen. Say, man, that church is so hateful. Yeah, yeah, they know truth, but where's the love? You can't. You, there's two extremes. We want to be balanced in our approach to ministry. Amen. Say, hey, we love people. We welcome people in. We don't care who you are. We don't care where you come from. We don't care how you dress. We want to give you the gospel because it's the truth. And we'll love you as long as we can, for as long as you're here, right? And so uh, people are desperate. People are hurting. People are going through bad marriages. People have past hurts from molestation or whatever. There's tons of things that you would never know about somebody. What I always like to say is if uh, I always think of like a big circle, right? Or say my hand. And uh, when I meet someone for the first time or maybe a few weeks or whatever, I know them. And, and really, when I get to talk to them, I put a little dot on my hand. I say, that's the, that, of all the time, I, I may have known some of y'all here 10 years, but I only know a dot about you. Because there's a whole bunch of other things in your life that I have no idea about that you carry with you, that you can express, that you're just silently suffering, whatever it may be. But that's people everywhere. Amen. People are suffering. People are desperate. People are hungry for truth. So give them the truth. In love, not in hate, not in judgmental attitude, not in nee, nee. no, no, give it in love. And so, uh, people have been greatly hurt by factors that uh, they think are right. People have been hurt by factors that are, are, are lies pushed to them by culture or pop culture, whatever have you, and they believe that those things are right, but they're very destructive. And I, I'm thinking of the homosexual community. I have, I had, I had a, or I have currently an aunt and an uncle who were both homosexual. But when my grandma died, she told her pastor, says that if I have to die, I am willing to let go and just give up. Not give up, don't get me wrong, but just I'm willing to die if my family can get saved. And they both got saved. My uncle, he's in a very high position, but he was a homosexual. And then he got saved. And then he did a complete 180, and he is a new man. Uh, my my uh, aunt, the same thing. She went home, told her partner, we can't be partners. They were into buying a house, fixing to buying a house. She says, we can't do this. That's not what Jesus likes. It's not what Jesus commands. That's not what the Bible teaches. And so people are desperate, but, but, but even I think of our youth. They're getting things pushed on them that doesn't need to be pushed on them Amen. at that young age when they're impressionable minds. And, and they think these things because, well, the you know, some teachers promoted and, and some rap stars promoted and some rock stars promoted and, and different pop culture people say this and there's information here and here and here and it's being fed and pushed on them. So yes, they think everybody is like this. So why shouldn't I conform to this? And then they find out later in life, I made the wrong choice. Amen. And that's very destructive. It's very hurtful. And so we need to understand that and treat them uh, tenderly and courteously in truth, in love, loving in truth. So love ought always to be the chief characteristics of Christians. It's the first fruit of the Spirit. Love. That's the chief characteristic. And so we pay lip service to it in quoting 1 Corinthians 13, but how often do we put it into practice? Third weapon is faith. Third weapon is faith. Faith is what Hebrews 12, 2 uh, tells us, looking unto Jesus. That's faith. Taking God at His word, that's faith. Uh, Faith is the recognition that God is present in history. He has not left us alone to stumble on our own way because God is at work. Colossians chapter 1, he tells us that Jesus is before all things and by Him all things consist. He is above all things. He has the preeminence in His church. 
And the Lord Jesus uh, sits in control of the nations of the earth currently. He says in Revelation 3, 7, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He has all the power. So faith believes that, and faith expects God to do a great work in our day. And in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, we have a great record of just ordinary men and women like you and me who found by simply acting upon faith, the Bible says, through faith they subdued kingdoms. They wrought righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. Uh, they quenched the violence of fire, and on and on and on it goes. Just ordinary day people like you and me who trusted God by faith and said, God, I know you can do a work. I know you're going to do a work. And I trust that you will do that work. And if it involves me, well, praise God, because it probably will. And so faith is employed in the ordinary human events and uh, changes the course of history through them. Because God desires to be proven. God wants to show himself faithful on the behalf of those that are diligently seeking him. Because that's the only way we can please God is by faith. Amen. And so God wants to show himself faithful all the time. And he shows yourself faithful. Someone say amen. He shows himself faithful in your life all the time. And so faith is not merely a thought that I lay hold of. It's not just a conviction that possesses me. Faith is life. It is a life. And faith brings the soul into direct contact um, with God and the unseen things of heaven. That's what faith does. Faith is looking to God for help. Faith is the hand that reaches out and takes God's gifts, receives God's provisions and His promises. Faith is, re excuse me, is resting and relying on the Lord for the fulfillment of all His promises, Amen. trusting His Word. 1 John 5, 4 says this, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. You are an Amen. overcomer. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. It's faith. So faith is a powerful weapon to use in the battle against our adversary, the devil, and of the system of the world. Fourth weapon could be prayer. The power of prayer is everywhere in Scripture. James 5 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It doesn't say it does a little bit of work. No, it, it does a lot of work. It's a good availing work. And we know from Daniel chapter 10 what fellowship lies and there exists between heaven and earth carrying on the work of God. Um, as soon as Daniel prayed, the angel became active. And the, he says, but the prince of Persia, the angel says, uh, the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia, rather, withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Good old Michael coming to the rescue. Amen. So in three weeks of strife in Daniel 10, 21 days, uh, three weeks of strife in the heavenlies uh, coincided with three weeks of prayer and fasting on earth. So you see how important prayer is. Conflict here on earth is the result of conflict in the heavenlies, Amen. in the invisible region of the heavenlies. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing, constantly in prayer. Uh, it's not as a faucet you would turn on and the water is just constantly coming out. You're not praying all the time because you have to. Use, some of us at work have to use our brains to go to work. We're not just mindlessly going like this and punching in numbers. You have to think about things, right? <laughs> I don't know anybody who goes to work unless you work maybe in a factory and all you just push a button. If that's you, I'm not trying to offend you, but you know, you know, you could daydream. But uh, we we have to think, so we can't pray constantly. But it's like a dripping faucet, praying without ceasing, Amen. lifting up prayers. Matthew six six, Jesus says, "But when thou, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet." He doesn't mean a physical closet. He just means get somewhere that's quiet. Get somewhere that's away and secluded. Yeah, I, I remember when my dad was preaching that, I think I was probably Ambrose's or Lachlan's age, and I was like, okay, I get in my closet. My closet was tiny. It was like as small as this pulpit. And I had, you know, five shirts and a couple pairs of jeans, and I'm getting in the closet like, okay, God, shut the door. I'm in the basement already. My, my family's out doing whatever. I'm in the closet like, dear Lord, my dad challenged us to pray for five minutes. As a six-year-old, for five minutes, it seems like an eternity. It's like trying to wait for dinner, right? Mom, are you done yet? Shut up, I'm cooking. Get out of my kitchen, right? <laughs> Throw a shoe at you. And you're sitting in there, and you're just like, oh, Lord. 
the, that doesn't, that's not what Jesus means, get in your physical closet. He just means get to a secluded place and pray. Because what, what, why, do we, why do we close our eyes, fold our hands, and bow our head? So we're not looking around being distracted. So our hands aren't fidgeting with things because of our ADD, right? And we're just like, hey, we're going to get, and we're bowing in reverential uh, fear of God and holiness, right? That's why we do those things. And so uh, in prayer, uh, Jesus says, when you go in your closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father that is in secret. Amen. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. We are constantly exhorted to expose and express the situations in which we find ourselves through prayer. God doesn't want you to harbor it all in. Does God know what you're going through? Absolutely, but He wants you to talk to Him. Amen. It's kind of like if your spouse is going through something and uh, doesn't want to talk to you about it, but the other spouse sees you going through that, well, they want you to talk to them about it. Amen? They're like, what is going on? And most women will say, nothing. Oh, you know there's something going on. <laughs> and so, ladies, nobody said amen. Okay, I get that. Darts are going past me. All right. So uh, we're constantly exhorted to expose those situations to prayer. Say, Lord, you know I'm going through this. Lord, and whatever it is, I'm not trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. But, Lord, you know this is a big step for me. And God says, I know. I'll take care of you. I'll walk you through it. Yeah. And someone else may look at that and say, what is the problem? What are they getting all bent out of shape for? Because you're not in it. And it's not for you, it's for them. Amen? Amen? And so we need to be reminded of that. But the Bible says, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Amen? We ought to be thankful for when God puts us through situations. Not saying, well, I'm so, I'm so happy I'm in this situation. No, God, what do you want to teach me through this? Amen. We went through this whole ordeal. God, what, what do I need to learn? How can I be a better Christian? Not, uh, not, not sitting there with a beam in our eye saying, how can they be a better Christian? Good grief, I'm the one who's spiritual here. Let's take a drink. Amen. So, Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for just the saints that you really like. No, the Bible says for all saints. For all saints. We ought to be individually and corporately uh, praying together that God would move in our church, Amen. that we should, that He would move in our community, that He would move in our great state here in our nation and change things. Uh, Matthew twenty six forty one says, "Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation." Yeah. Jesus says that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is absolutely weak. The flesh is weak; it wants to sleep. It doesn't want to pray. The devil doesn't want you to pray. And so, when you start to think that you can handle situations on your own, when you get it in, in, in your head that by your own power, I can handle this, and, and without prayer, well, then you have ceased from trusting God. You have ceased from walking in the Spirit, and for not even the Lord Jesus Himself, in His flesh, on this earth, would go one day without prayer. Are you better than Jesus? Probably not. Um, and so we as believers, because of the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself to God, we are called to be intercessors. We have a mighty privilege to pray on the behalf of others and for others. In 1 Timothy, we're told in chapter 2 and verse 1, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. He doesn't say, I exhort therefore that first of all, you point all your little fingers you can at people. Say how sinful they are. No, no, no. You should pray for them. Amen. Pray for them. Give it up to the Lord and say, you know what? I know they don't get it. I know they're not, they're, they're not there. Lord, help them to get there. As a pastor, I see people uh, here, and I, my job is to get them, or I would like to get them over here on the mountain. Some people, you, ha you have to prod, you have to plead, you have to drag if you can, but you can't do it. It has to be the work of God. And so as a pastor, I'm just being honest with you, I see people over here, I'm like, good, just, just get up. Just get up and come over to the mountain. There's so much joy. There's way better grass than mud. Why are you eating the, the tree bark? What are you doing? Come over here to the pasture that God is leading us to and feast your head off. God wants to bless your socks off. 
But many people just stay in here, and this is all they do. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me and my feelings. But they, 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 don't, they don't do what the shepherd tries to get them to do and look up and say, where's everybody else at? Well, they done left you a long time ago because they couldn't stand to be around your sad butt. Well, I just, I, get away from me. I don't want to be around anybody. God doesn't want you to be like that. He wants you to have your head up. He wants you to be prancing like a, you know, a little, uh, a little, a little lamb in the, in the meadow. <laughs> like a little Bambi, whatever it is. He wants you to eat the good grass. He says, yes, he, though he, he leadeth, he leadeth me by the still waters, right? He, he brings me to the pastures that are green. He takes me down into the vat. Well, what's happening here in Psalm 23? It's all about the shepherd. The great shepherd, the, the chief shepherd, he's the one that's going with me. He's the one that's leading me. He's the one that's bringing me. He's the one that's prodding me. He's the one that uses his rod at times. And he's the one that's going that gets all the glory for everything in my life, Amen. even though I'm so mm, stiff-necked to trust him. And so again, the record testifies that the events have been drastically uh, altered by Christians who pray. Jude uh, uh, verse 20 says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Fifth weapon. Like, man, we're not even in uh, 2 Corinthians. Oh, we're, we'll, we'll continue. Don't worry. Number five is service. Service. Like, how is that a weapon? Just bear with me. Amen. Jesus says in Matthew 5 in the great Beatitude sermon, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Bless them that, cur that, that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Amen. Do something good back. When was the last time you did that? Someone said something, someone did something that offended you. When's the last time you said, I'll pray for you? When's the last time you did something good back, like get them a uh, Starbucks, oh, maybe not Starbucks, maybe a uh, uh, Black Rifle Coffee card or something, I don't know, whatever. You drink Starbucks, go ahead. That's fine. Um, but this is what changes culture. What changes culture? When Christians act differently. Amen. That's the only way. Uh, you, you don't change the world by being like the world because you're just like them. You have nothing to offer them. But if you live the life of a Christian, you live the life that Jesus wants you to live, they'll take note and say, I'm going to watch them because they just lost you know, some relatives, but they have joy. There's a, uh, my pastor, um, his wife, her dad, uh, she lost, um, uh, how many siblings was it? Do you remember? Yeah, it was three siblings and her mom in a bus, uh, a school accident on the way to school. And that was my pastor's wife. She was the only little girl that survived. But yet there's a picture of her dad, the pastor of the church, with three little caskets and his wife behind him saying, hey, welcoming people. And there's a picture of him smiling. How in the world can you be smiling when you just lost your family? That's only Jesus. That's only Jesus. I can't explain it to you any other way than that. And so you'll, you'll never find non-Christians acting differently than the world because they are the world. They're worldly. And so their demand in our flesh wants to get even. It wants, uh, it demands justice, right? It wants justice. We all want justice, but the right justice. Amen. That is only through Jesus Christ. Amen. And need I remind you that if we had proper justice, all of us would, end, would be in hell. If, if we got what we deserve, we would be in hell. Therefore, mercy is what is required. James tells us the mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Jesus said in Luke 6.36, Be therefore merciful as your Father is merciful. Yeah. To return good for evil is a potent weapon that we can employ. Amen. And Paul uses a very vivid word to describe the errors that we are attacking through spiritual warfare. He says this in verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of, say the next two words, strongholds. Strongholds. It's a military word. Um, and the people in the city would build a sturdy structure um, for security, obviously, and, and protection. And 
inside that walled city, uh, uh, although that's for security, inside it they would build another stronghold, something that they could run into the tower and be safe. That's what the children of God are supposed to do. Our Lord is our high tower. He is our buckler. He is our shield. He is our strength. He is our deliverer. He is our protector. And so they would go into this massively fortified tower where they could retreat. Uh, uh, Safe am I within the castle of God's word retreating. Nothing then can move me. Tis Beulah land. Right? We sing it. Do you believe it? Do you trust God and retreat into the castle? So this is a word that vividly, vividly describes some of the evils we are talking about this morning. The, the, these evils of things are called strongholds. Strongholds. Why is it so difficult to handle the homosexual issue today? Why is it so difficult uh, to handle the rising divorce rate and the attack on the home today? Why is it so difficult to handle drug and human trafficking today? Why is it so difficult to uh, handle the murder of unborn babies today? These are real social issues that are happening today. And we're saying, man, it's so hard that. So what do you do against those things? And, and to what do these strongholds refer to? He tells us in verse 5. He says, casting down imaginations. The first stronghold are imaginations against God. Imaginations against God. The word is reasonings is literally what he means. The reasonings. Imagination takes place in the mind. It's how people think against God. It means that people are rationalizing uh, by which a point of error is supported and defended. Hey, I'm, a, I'm going to rationalize my position or whatever it may be. You ever notice that when you get upset about some things uh, that are happening in our day, you decide to do something about it? Say, I'm going I'm to do something about this instead of just watching this on, on TV and stop listening to the news. But then, you, but then when you want to do something about it, you're very soon confronted with arguments that the other side uses to defend itself that at times, not all the time, but at times seem to be irrefutable. Like, yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. And then you cower back and you're like, yeah, maybe they got a point there. But Paul is saying that, that our weapons, they destroy the way people think. They destroy the way people think. And they demolish their sinful thought patterns and the mental structures by which they live their lives in rebellion against God. Amen. He says you're casting down, a military term, to, to break down these imaginations, these reasonings for why they do what they do. And so it's only as we utilize the weapons of truth, the weapons of love, the weapons of prayer and faith and service that this will happen. They will reveal that behind these arguments are just vain uh, suppositions and unrealistic assumptions that are not true. And it, it can be demonstrated that uh, homosexuality, for instance, is not love. Say, well, well, we just love each other. Honest homosexuals, my aunt and uncle could tell you, admit that they are not satisfied, their lives are not enriched by that lifestyle. Rather, they find themselves hopelessly launched on a search for something that can never truly uh, find or satisfy. Amen. And they're experiencing an increase in depression and disappointment in their pursuit of that. Amen. For instance, a nationwide survey by the Trevor Project focused on the mental health of LGBTQ from uh, 18 years old to 24 years old. That's a number that I'm interested in. 39% of homosexual youth seriously considered unaliving their self. 39% from 18 to 24, all homosexual youth decided to unalive themselves. There was a thought that was there because that lifestyle does not fulfill what God made in them. And that was in the past year. That number was even higher for transgender and non-binary youth at 46%. More than 1 in 10 in the last year attempted suicide because it doesn't bring fulfillment. I'm bringing facts to you this morning. And so this is where a Christian can come along in a loving demeanor, in a truthful word, and point out that that is exactly the case. 
that you will not find fulfillment here. Instead of coming and saying, you wretched people and you sodomites and things like that. No, no, no. Come in love. Amen. God didn't, do, Jesus didn't do that. The, the, that's exactly what the Lord Jesus did with the woman at the well in Samaria. Well, well I, don't, I, don't, I don't get what you're referring to. He dealt with her unending search of happiness in, in marriage, in showing her that she was on a wild goose chase that would never, it could never end in anything but utter frustration. He says, why? Well, he says, go to, your home, go to your husband. She's like, well, I, 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 don't, I don't have him right now because he was probably going to leave me. He's like, yeah, you're right. You had five husbands. Do you get it yet that what you're doing in searching for marriage is, is unfulfilling because you're looking at it and going about it the wrong way? In a lustful way, in an in a arrogant way, in a, in a woe is me way? You're not going to find fulfillment in it. Jesus says this to the woman, and he deals with her not in a harsh way. He just says it truthfully and in lovingly. Christ has the true gift of satisfaction. Amen. He has the true gift of purpose. He has the true gift of meaning in life. Why? He calls himself the living water. Amen. He said in John 4, Whosoever drinketh of this water is going to thirst again. Physical water. You drink of that, you're going to thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That's the Christian approach. Say, hey, what you're doing over here, it's not going to satisfy. It's dis you know, I'm disgusted by this, but I love you as a person because you need Jesus. And hello, last time I checked, pride is an abomination just as homosexuality is, and we all suffer from pride. So check yourself at the door before you get all judgmental on someone who is trying to live this gay lifestyle. Everyone needs Jesus Christ. Every single one. And you need to love them with compassion. Hating the garment, even spotted by flesh, pulling them out of the fire. You can hate the garment, love the person. And so Jesus dealt with it in that way. And in, that, in dealing with it that way, it destroys the arguments. It destroys these strongholds of imaginations that people are putting out against us to get us to fold to society in these reasonings. The second stronghold, it says this in verse 5, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. So the second stronghold is every high thing against God. And uh, uh, do you know what they are? If, if you read the writings that defend error in our day, you will see what their core beliefs are. Uh, that man is superior in every matter of life. You'll see that he doesn't need God. You'll see that it's humanism at the core. And that people uh, often get offended when that is attacked or questioned in any way and it turns into a yelling match, which doesn't get anywhere. Amen. Humanism rejects religion. Humanism uh, rejects supernaturalism. It rejects the existence of God. It, uh, it concerns itself only with the state of humanity in this life. It says this is all there is, that's all that matters, we don't need God, and we care, rather as Christians, we care about a man's eternal soul. Because he's a living and breathing being made in the image of God. Mark 8 tells us, For what shall I profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I watched a very sad uh, video, a very sad uh, mini documentary about, I think it was called The Growth Man. If you want it, that's what I think it's called. He did The Growth Man. It's like eight minutes. And I just played it while I was doing other things. But it shows this, this man, I don't remember his age, uh, but at nine years old he was growing, and then on his growth and height chart, it started decreasing. At nine, ten years old, he started losing inches. He was so concerned that he wasn't going to grow, they started giving him these growth hormone shots. And he became addicted to them, and he decided that his ultimate purpose was to become the tallest man on earth. He wanted to be 8 foot 11 inches, or 11 and 3 quarter inches, so he could outdo the Guinness World Book of Records. And the man looks like a giant. He's very scary. He can't walk right. But he's, he's doing this, and his mom is crying. Like, I don't, I don't know if we did the right thing. He's like, no, it's mom. It's okay. It's on me. This is all in the interview. And he says, you know, if, if I can reach that 8 foot and 11 and 3 quarter inches, I'll be fulfilled. You know what happened? He died in 2022 at six foot one. That's the purpose. Things like that people are living for. So when you see someone like that, their mind is so warped. 
The, the weapons of our warfare can crumble those things Amen. only through the power of God. And how, how, how sad that is that our youth are getting fed different things that is going to somehow give them fulfillment, but then in the end they're, they're wanting to be done with themselves. It's a very sad reality. And so we come in and, and, and every high thing that's exalted itself against God. You know, what's it going to profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? It doesn't profit him anything. There's no point. The, 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 the highest achievement, listen to me, the highest achievement as a Christian in your life is to lead another soul to Christ. That is the highest achievement in your Christian life. If, if you can't do it, please come to a class and I'll teach you how. I'll go out with you personally and I'll teach you how. Hey, 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 are you the one that leads people to Christ? No, 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 I'm just the delivery boy. The Holy Spirit does the work. I can't make someone get saved, but I can use verses to the Bible, the weapons of our warfare and truth to lead people to the truth who are in darkness. It's the highest achievement you can ever have in your Christian walk, in your Christian life to lead another soul to Christ. It gives you joy beyond belief and a fulfillment of purpose. Like this is what God boarded me again for. Amen. So I can be a vessel of, from which others can also have life. It's amazing. And so uh, the Bible says that we are to, in verse 5, casting down these things. It means tearing down or overpowering these speculations or these reasonings. The imaginations refers to arguments or theories or reasonings that people hold to. Worldly thoughts, ideas, reasonings, uh, philosophies, are like strongholds in people's minds. Yeah. And in that, they, they function in effect to um, barricade uh, uh, enemy intruders like the gospel, God's word. Amen? His truth. Uh, people put, build up these things in their mind where they reject the gospel and they have these reasonings and these suppositions that are, not, that are contrary to truth to build up their tower to retreat into so the enemy can't come in with the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. Amen. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says this, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Amen. Turn over with me uh, to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, actually. I'm going to have you look at this so we're not sitting here like ducks in the water. Imaginations, speculations, men's revelations of untruths are diametrically opposed to God's revelation of truth. And God describes the wise thoughts, the reasonings, the presuppositions and ideas of the world as worthless. He says in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, in verse 19, For the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. Very simple. For it is written, He that he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are, say the word, vain, empty. Imaginations against God, every high thing that exalted itself against God. And the third stronghold in our text this morning, he says back in 2 Corinthians 10, casting down imaginations, Casting down these every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of, of God. And the third stronghold is bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Amen. So imaginations against God, every high thing against God, and then our very own thoughts against God. Amen. We need to employ the weapons by bringing them into captivity uh, to the obedience of Christ. And that is these imaginations, the, this knowledge, these thoughts, and obvious, it's so obvious that there's a war going on. Amen. There is a war going on. Satan's behind it, and your mind is the battleground. He wants you to become a casualty. Satan, uh, his desire is to conquer and to control your thought life. He wants to do that. And then make your thought life a fortress of which he can get in and wage his war against God. In your very thoughts. We need to think this way. We are, not, we are not just sitting here passive Christians. We need to be actively engaged in the war. We are Amen. soldiers marching on to war. Amen. And we're not fighting for victory. Although we need victory in our lives, we are to fight from victory. Because victory was given us at the cross. Amen. The only power that Satan has over your life is what the authority that you give him when you allow the temptation to come in and bring forth death. 
That's what we do with Christ, or that's what we do with Satan. We are to cast those thoughts away. When uh, this word thoughts in our text comes up, it's these are the fantasizings that we indulge in. That's one of the hardest things for people with addiction, uh, uh, in, in certain natures of addiction, uh, that uh, they indulge in a fantasy. So one of the hardest things to get out of, uh, of addictions is the fantasy. Remember one time I visited uh, this lady at the hospital and um, she was addicted to alcohol. And she says, she said, Pastor, I can, I can just taste it. I can just taste She hasn't had a drink in six months. But I can just taste it. Or I visit another guy in the hospital who overdosed on some drugs. He says, I just can't help myself. I just fantasize of what I'm going to do during that time. And this is the hardest thing for people to get past is these thoughts, these fantasizings. And even Christians today, we can have fantasizing thoughts, can we not? We can have sinful fantasizing thoughts. We can have daydreams of power. We can have daydreams of accomplishment. Uh, we can have daydreams of lusting by which to attempt uh, to satisfy our, uh, Im- our desires, erotic desires. You'll never win the battle as long as you allow yourself to indulge in those type of fantasizings. Amen. You'll never win. That is why the apostle faces us with the facts that we have to bring those things unto and under obedience to Christ. Amen. That's why he says that. And we can't no longer permit them to engage and reside in our minds and our hearts and then turn out in actions. Amen. And so there, there are uh, 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 these are conquered these thoughts are conquered by truth these co- these thoughts are conquered by love these things are conquered by righteousness by prayer by service uh, those are some of the weapons of our warfare there's many more but this is what Paul's referring to in verse 6 he says and having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled so in context here the once the Corinthian church responds in obedience to the gospel it would become very clear who among them were still in disobedience. Because people come into a church all the time and say they're saved, but they don't live like it. They may not be. We're just to be fruit inspectors. And man, that is not that is not how a Christian responds. Maybe it's ignorance, maybe it's carnality, or maybe they're not saved. I, I don't know. But when he says obedience fulfilled, uh, it refers to their being fully committed to Jesus Christ as Lord. Right? Then Paul could effectively separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. He says, all right, I, I know who's, who's, who's in this and who's not in this. Who's, who's causing the dissension? Who's really on board here? And so the result would be a church that's set free from the false teaching, is set free from the false teachers, from the false ideologies that permeates the church, at least for a time, because Satan comes, he tempts, and he leaves, but he comes again for another season. And so those who desire to obey Christ will show evidence of it by the casting out of those false ideas by those false teachers. And so we have to maintain an alertness. We have to maintain a um, um, uh, dealing promptly with any of those thoughts and those ideologies or philosophies that want to oppose God in our minds, yeah. right? And so m- many people struggle for years against lust. Many people struggle for years uh, against immorality. Many people struggle for years against anger. Many people struggle for years against anxiousness and anxiety. Many people struggle for years about bitterness against anyone and even God in their lives for not doing what he said he was going to do and taking his sweet time. God, help us if you think that way about God. And then we wonder why we get nowhere. Say, well, why, why, why am I struggling with those things? Because you're trying to stop the act. You're not trying to stop the inward thought that precipitates it. Very quiet in here. And then people wonder, why, uh, why am I so weak when an opportunity comes to indulge in that act? These thoughts and these desires and these temptations don't just vanish away when you become a Christian. They don't just go away like, huh, I'm fine. I have nothing to worry about now. No. Now you got a whole warfare to worry about, and you see things for what they really are. And that's not the way God works in any area of struggle with sin. In any area of struggle with sin, it just doesn't leave you, it stays. And it wants to wreak havoc in your life. And so we have to make repeated choices then to acknowledge Christ as Lord, and to say, you are Lord, 
and the pleasure that I can only have is found in you anyway. So why would I take this temporary pleasure, this temporary satisfaction that doesn't satisfy, and I feel terrible when I indulge in it. So why do I continue to do that? Because you don't trust God. You don't trust God. We have to submit and acknowledge Christ as Lord. We submit to Him and we deny the flesh. It has to be that way. What does the devil tell you, class, when he wants you to indulge in something sinful, whatever it may be, whether it's anxiousness, whether it's depression, whether it's lustful, sinful desires, whether it's fantasizing, whether it's becoming angry and wanting to hit someone, what, is, what does the devil say? Well, just this once. Just this one, okay, I get it, you know, you're on fire for God, you want to live for God, but just, just do this thing this one time and then I won't bother you again. No, oh, it's a lie! Amen. It's a cotton-picking lie! Amen. And so we deny the flesh, or we need to, and so over time, the draw to that sin becomes weaker, and our satisfaction in Christ becomes stronger. The more you deny the flesh, you deny the temptation. Oh, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I go through things. You go through things. We're human. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's hard to deny the flesh. But you need to do it because God wants you to have the victory in your life. He says, I don't want you living over here in despondency and anxiousness and anger and frustration and evil lasciviousness. I want you to live over here in hope and in joy, and in peace, and in comfort, and prosperity. Yeah. That's what God wants. And so over time, that sin, if we deny it, will become weaker. I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight. It may be months. It may be years. It may be several years. And you fighting this, and fighting this, and fighting this, and saying Christ is more. Christ is better. Christ is where I fulfill my purpose. Christ gives me pleasure. Christ, 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 Christ. And then finally, you say, you know, I don't even have a problem with that anymore. But then guess what? A new one comes. Woo! Ain't that like the devil? He says, oh, you thought we was over, huh? Yeah, we're going to have a lot more for you today. Griping up, eating them of them, the biscuits. Amen? Here's some more gravy. You want some more? How about another? We say, Lord, I really like biscuits and gravy, but I'd rather have you. Amen. Oh, my flesh loves biscuits and gravy. My body goes to show it, but I need you. That's what God wants for us. So we have to renew our minds in God's Word. There is a difference between winning the spiritual battle for our minds at the moment of temptation and the long-term growth process of renewing your mind in truth. There's a difference. You can win the victory here, but now you have to continue doing that. It ain't just a one-time and you're done deal and woohoo, you got the victory. That's a continually growth in truth, a growth in grace. We need, excuse me, we need God's grace every single day. You need it. I need it. We all need it. And so renewing our minds with truth is an ongoing process that we have to actively work and sustain at. It, it is a workout, working out your Christianity, working out your salvation. Amen. Amen. You're working those things out. Well, why do we say I got to work out? Because you want to get some more muscle. You want to lose some more fat. You want to be a little bit more, uh, have a little bit more endurance. Go get a sledgehammer. Start working. Do something spiritually and trust in God. And so David said in Psalm 119, verse 15 and 16, I will meditate on thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Rehearsing the truth again and again is the key to renewing the mind. Saying, God, this is what your word says. This is what you This is what you said. I have a problem with this temptation. I know that that's wrong. How can I put on the new man? I have a temptation in this area. What is the truth to combat that? I have a temptation in this area. What's the truth to combat that? And you start to stop thinking like the old man and put on the new man and walk in holiness and righteousness. And so God even promises spiritual success to those who meditate on the Word of God so that they might obey it. And this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt have, uh, make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua 1 8. God promises that, that spiritual success. You read Scripture, you study it, you memorize it. God help us if you don't have 
like pastor does and like several other Christians, have a stack of cards memorizing Scripture. You should have that. Say, well, I don't have cards. I have it on digital. No, you need a physical thing to get out, write the pen, so you're writing it, seeing it, and you're memorizing it. You have to memorize Scripture. It is the only way to combat things. Well, I can just pull it out in my Bible. Not at the moment of temptation. Your Bible's way over on the other side of the house. You need it right here in your heart. And we need to listen to it. We need to saturate our minds with it. And we need God's Word in every way in our mind, in every way we can. Because the battleground is our thought life. That's what Paul is telling us. And that's what Paul wants for us today. He says, look, I I don't want you to think that um, you know, this is something that's easy. Obviously, the weapons of our warfare uh, are not something that are weak. They are mighty through God. That's the only way. So we must continue to be careful to bring into captivity those thoughts uh, to the obedience of Christ. We're not to use carnal weapons. I said earlier, we don't use ballots. It's not fought with ballots. It's not fought with bullets. It's the natural ideas or any natural idea of our flesh, our warfare, The spiritual weapons are mighty through God. And only as we allow God and we yield to Him uh, can He then pull down those strongholds. Say, I got some big strongholds. Well, then you have a big God as well. And God will do the same thing. And so by truth, by love, by righteousness, uh, by prayer, by service, we can become victorious in our Christian lives. We can become victorious in our Christian thinking, our living, and our testimony to the world. The problem ain't the world. It is us who do not use the weapons at our disposal. Shame on us. May God help us to understand the nature of spiritual warfare. We are not hopeless. We are not helpless. We are victors in Christ. Let us begin to live righteously ourselves to see that we maintain integrity in the midst of the decay of culture and love those who are opposing us. Uh, God has placed in our hands the opportunity to change ourselves. As we allow Him, we can change our homes, we can change our community, we can change our nation. May God grant that we do it. Ye are the salt of the earth, Jesus says. You are the light of the world. Now go out and utilize your weapons. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we do thank You for the Word of God.